to see a number of companies competing over who can provide this, this geosequencing data, which is a true data deluge, uh, because it will not just be using LP various other things I'll talk about in a moment. Um, but the security basis is interpreted with uh, vast amounts of uh, public and private information. And so some of them will say, oh, I'm better than company X, brand X, because we have a 50 page report on your genome, while they only have a 10 page report. And that may sound like a really great sales pitch at first, but I think the appropriate um, report link is half a page, right? It's like if somebody tells me, oh, hey, I'm going to give you directions on how to get back home from the Renaissance. Um, I got a 50 page report on how to do that. And I'll say, thank you. I got a, a better way to get it over that. And so that's, uh, I think you know, there's an interesting discussion about that. So what's next? Uh, when I said there's more than the security base of the genome, um, there is a, what I think is next is, is this real-time sequencing that's going to produce a data that for each person. It would be as if we had a video camera on our uh, cell phone kind of put to our uh, chest, you know, to her, uh, and it's uh, just constantly streaming all the video data. Uh, but it's, it's also data we don't normally see. As we walk through the world, and somebody's knees like, you know, if it was just a second here. Somebody's knees like this. Um, you know, we say, see, that's, you know, so we say, see, I wonder what that is. Um, could it be a neural reflex, which is where no, no, nothing infectious is happening, or an allergy, or could it be, you know, like, uh, you know, the people uh, or like, anything flu or something like that, um, which is truly a pandemic uh, or, or, or a threat season. And the thing is, we really don't know. I mean, <laughs> how many people here have gone to the decision but with uh, cancer disease or something and gotten the diagnosis? I think it's sad and hilarious to I've never got one. Um, I've got some through, through the personal genome project, but I've not, you know, I've done this research. Um, and I think it's, it's like being blind. You know, it literally is, you can't see the, our environment. Uh, you can't see we're running into something that uh, uh, allergens or, or uh, a whole variety of uh, bacteria and functional viruses. But the nanopore data that kind of went through uh, comes from devices like this. Um, which are, by the way, we can go back to the data if anybody wants to get through the menu of topics we could have this dialogue about. That is a 70 gram device, and it'll certainly look smaller. I think it'll be something you can clip on. Um, we're going to have a Bluetooth connection and some other connection to your cell phone, and we'll stream what's going on. This is called, they call it real time uh, analysis. It's not quite as real time as I would like. I would like something that really um, takes the air or water or the samples from your body and tells you the metabolized proteins <laughs> and the uh, nucleic acid in your environment. It's just not there yet. But it's good. That, that would be a source of big data that we'll be seeing more and more. And, uh, and these are not just uh, observations. I kind of tried to stress from the very first slide that it's not just about watching and diagnosing. It's really about treatments. And, and whole new categories of treatments are coming out through the big data. So the microbiome and metabolome were originally sort of just research observations. They were big data on, as you might imagine, microorganisms and viruses and metabolism. And it's turning really into therapeutics. I'm just going to give you a tiny subset, highly biased towards somebody who's involved in full disclosure. But things like, uh, you get concentrated to your seal. And I realize this is a very subtle medical photograph, uh, but uh, you have some serious companies like Sirius. So you provide microorganisms that will compete with this serious one. This, this is present in many people. Um, but when you take antibiotics, uh, ironically, it causes this thing to uh, flare up and, and can be um, painful to deadly. Um, but if you have the right microbiome, which is normally obtained by fecal transplant, which is not well controlled, it's usually for you know, somebody who, who's willing to give you a fecal transplant. Uh, you can do your home, but it's not the sort of thing the FDA would be excited about. I would think if you want something that's reproducible and you can go quality control on, that's what Sirius does. Another source of, 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 of it's big data and, and you know, large computational tasks that we do has to do with protein uh, design. And I think they put nucleic acid design. So here, color coded nucleic acids of DNA and RNA and red, blue, and protein for TN. And this particular collection is on a my original computational uh, background was in um, crystallography, so I did this sort of stuff uh, as a teenager. Um, of course, none of these were known at that time, but, uh, but the idea is that now, we finally, back then, it was a dream that four years ago was a dream that you could uh, do protein design uh, at will, that you could take, of course, crystal, say, gold, and engineer a protein the way you would a car or um, clothing or what have you. And, and, uh, and so he, and this particular set is a very special set because this, this is kind of a self-referential kind of a self-compiler compiler, if you will. This is a set, uh, I think, a complete set of proteins that we can use for editing genomes. Um, and uh, the one you hear about a lot is CRISPR, up in the upper right here. But uh, I think it gets a disproportionate share of the intensity. I, I can say that because I was one of the co-inventors of it. Um, but, I, but we worked on many of these things, and I think they each have, still have uh, very important uses. But the point is we engineer these based on this municipal structure, and they get better and better. Um, and these are just one particular category. We work with many other categories. And so it's just an example of how we then use the, the computationally designed uh, proteins that are capable of 
designing the DNA that encodes the cells as well as the other DNA. Here's an example of what, what I think is going to be a growing industry, which is what's called hyperbook causality. That is to say, when you get your six billion base pairs, there'll be three million differences between you and me, and uh, your report will probably come up with a zero, but there's no risk factors, even though we know that it's not. But the thing is, we're not that worried about false negatives right now, because if you don't get your report, then you have 100% false negatives. Um, and so if you get anything on your report at all, it's actionable, and that's great. But there's a whole bunch of things that are called variants on no significance. And this was one of those, this warning on the X chromosome of this um, uh, poor child, um, was thought to be the cause of the maladies, the cardiomyopathy, and so on. And, uh, it's, and, and so, but the child, like sorry, everybody, had three million differences from the reference genome, and from, for that matter, uh, about that number from um, parents as well. So there's a, there's a big, vast uh, amount of background noise. And so how do you know it's that one? I mean, you might have a few biologically inspired guesses, but the way you prove it is you, is you get rid of that gene in uh, cells where the only difference is that gene. Now that's a very unnatural situation to become to uh, human cells that differ by one base pair, and you know where that is. But, but here's remember, that TCP is this uh, cohort, this worldwide cohort that we can use for a whole variety of, of really uh, uh, great data sharing, and in this case, cell line sharing. And so we can make from TCP1, with full disclosure, on TCP1. Uh, so these cells came from another farm. This is skin cells, turned them into stem cells, uh, for those stem cells, which then can be turned into cardiac muscle, and you'll see that's like how beautiful that, that is. But before, first we wanted to make two versions of my cells, which signify this one bonding to test the cause and effect. Is that bonding necessarily sufficient to cause the, the, the various disease genotypes that can include lipid composition, mitochondrial problems, and cardiac uh, issues? And you might say, well, you know, how is a skin cell or even a stem cell relevant to cardiac function? And the answer is that we can reprogram them it now. Uh, any small stem cell is almost any other tissue or organ. Uh, we sometimes modestly call them organoids because they're not exactly the same as organs. But each day, each year, they get a little bit closer to uh, the real thing. So now, Bill Fu was our collaborator who brought us to the clinical um, hypothesis. It was that one line out of six billion big years. And uh, Kip Harker helped us with the uh, organ, organ reprogramming. We, we normally work on, on brain uh, organs, uh, and, and sort of brain and a, and a dish sort of thing. And Kip works on cardiac muscles. But together, we, we made this cardiac tissue here which is this uh, beautiful repeating structure and, uh, and, and uh, it beats about one um, per second. And you can see the impact of one base pair um, on the morphology, on the contraction, and all the biochemistry is uh, exactly messed up in the way that the, that the child uh, displayed. So uh, this is um, pretty convincing evidence that that one base pair was efficient. And you might just say, well, how do you know you just changed one base pair? You know, uh, maybe it was maybe some other things that got changed and they were really the cause of it. Um, well, first of all, we must know what those happened to be, the cause, you know, that they were random mutations that we caused that happened to have the same phenotype. But uh, the other thing is we, we now think nothing of my students, uh, think nothing of if you change one base pair in the lab to sequence souls, you know. And so it's pretty routine that they go around to those, um, but when they just to check that one base pair, they should nothing about the other six billion change, they'll sequence it. And you can change it back. And so the reverse process of changing it back is going forward is a cause and effect analysis. Changing it back is called gene therapy. And so some of the companies I mentioned earlier on had a positive quality and support. They basically uh, are doing that now in kind of clinical uh, trials. Um, so yes, you can, you can go back and forth. Now that's an uh, example of a rare inherited disease that was uh, where we wanted no cause and effect. It's a very unknown to the nose There's a there's a popular uh, set of diseases uh, where in, in industrialized countries, and, you know, wealthy countries like the United States, about 90% of us will die from a disease which does not affect 20 year olds for the most part. And some, some people don't recognize aging as a disease, but certainly uh, it's the cause, the underlying cause of many. And it is reversible. And so when some people when I use the word aging reversal, some people think I'm talking about science fiction. This is science fact in animals. Um, and, and I can give you a dozen different experiments, but here's, here's one particular one. We have what's called heterochronic paralysis, where an old and young mouse are sitting together to share a secondary system. And, uh, and you get multiple organ systems that are positively impacted in the old mouse. These include the skeletal and cardiac muscle, the bones, and the nerves. Um, and not all the factors are responsible uh, for this are known yet, but there is general consensus that this, that this paradigm, this sharing of blood, is, uh, is robust and reproducible. Um, that's only one of, I'd say, about a dozen different ways of getting aging in animals. This has not been tried in humans for reasons that you, can, you might imagine. Um, but once we have purified factors, then we'll go into clinical trials and like everything else. Here's a second example, a last example, of where a particular compound is uh, very core to a mitochondrial function, which is called uh, NAD, or the Nicotinamide Z precursor. 